Theatre Phonic presents And the Angels Sing Written by Nigel Foster BBC Light programme on Saturday 19th June 1965. Here is the latest news from the arts. The UK number one hit single for this week is Elvis Presley with his song Crying in the Chapel. You saw me cry. That's plenty enough of that, thank you. Daddy? Hmm? Will you help me fix his hair fix kit? It's great because it's a Lancaster bomber, like you used to fly in the war. Maybe after lunch, Andy. I'm a bit busy at the moment. Oh, Brill, thanks, Daddy. You know the war? Mm-hmm. When you were in the RAF? Yes, Poppet. Did you kill any Germans? Hmm? Whatever do you mean? You were front gunner, right? Well, yes, that's right. My main job was to release the bombs... But when I wasn't doing that and we were under attack, I would sit at the very front of the plane. There, inside that perspex turret you can see on the picture in your airfix box. That's where I would man the machine guns. That's really cool. How many Nazi planes did you shoot down? <laughs> well, none, so far as I know. Mark you, I did blaze away into the darkness with my guns, but the truth is I didn't hit anything. Oh. How do you know you didn't? Oh, because everyone in the whole squadron kept a good lookout for any enemy planes getting hit. That was so the right person got the praise for it when we arrived back at the airfield. Oh. Never mind, Popsy. I only flew missions during the last two months of the war, when we had pretty much beaten Hitler. There were relatively few Luftwaffe planes left in the first part of 1945, when Bomber Harris's daughter sent us over the German towns. Who's Bomber Harris? And how come his daughter was doing stuff? Ah, now his real name was Air Chief Marshal Arthur Harris, and he was in charge of the whole of RAF Bomber Command. But everyone just knew him as Bomber Harris. You see, none of us could fathom out why we would be sent to attack Dortmund one night and then the next night somewhere in southwestern Germany, and then maybe a northern port like Hamburg the following night. It just made no sense. Anyhow, at the time, there were popular stories going round the mess that Bomber Harris didn't actually choose the targets himself, but he sat his youngest daughter Rosemary on his knee, and she was the one who chose our target for that day, by randomly sticking a golden pin into a map of Germany. Wow! Is that true? <laughs> no, no, not in the slightest bit. It was all made up, you see. But it made a good mess story at the time. Actually, I discovered much later that by 1945... His youngest daughter was actually a grown-up lady of twenty-two. Oh, so hardly likely to have been sitting on his knee. Oh. Daddy, were you frightened during the war? No. And yes. There was a lot of hanging around at the airbase and simply waiting, which was all really boring and not in the least frightening. Oh, the war seemed a long way off during those days. But when we flew nighttime missions... Yes, it was pretty scary, because as we got closer and closer to the target, there would be more and more anti-aircraft shells exploding all around the plane. In the total darkness, you couldn't ever see them coming up at you, only when they exploded loudly, which on a few occasions got so close the plane would even roll a bit. <gasps> it would be a constant barrage that went on and on and on. You got to the point where you wondered if it would ever stop, and you never knew if the next shell would actually hit the plane, or it would all go down in flames. Tell you the truth, Bomber Command's casualties were frighteningly high. What was it now? Something like uh, of a total of 125,000 aircrew, over 55,000 died. Do you know, that was almost half of all of us. They reckoned the Lancaster Bomber was one of the most dangerous places to be in the entire war. The life expectancy of a new recruit at one point was just two weeks. Survival rates were not much better than when your grandpa was flying in rickety wooden biplanes on the Western Front in the Great War. But our pilot George was really skilful, and thankfully we were never hit. So you were lucky to have survived, all of you? Oh yes, indeed we were. Incredibly lucky, Andy. 
I sometimes wonder why me? Why did I get to live after flying nighttime missions when so many thousands of others never made it home to their girlfriends or families? Well, it's very humbling, to be honest with you. What was he like? George, I mean. What was George like? <laughs> well, I can still clearly remember the first time I met George. Evening. It's Paul, isn't it? Yes, sir, that's right. I'm you. I transferred yesterday from Balderton. Balderton? Well, at least that wasn't too long a trip for you. The flat Lincolnshire roads around here get unbelievably tedious after a while. So, bombing training all complete, and now you're on your first mission. Well, welcome to RAF Spilsby and 207 Squadron. And by the way, none of this sir business. It's strictly first name terms on my plane. Or nicknames, of course. No hierarchies when we all need to work as a team. I'm George, but if you'd rather, most of the boys prefer to call me Skipper. Or Skip. Fine by me, George. Skip. Thanks. Up the ladder you go, and turn to your right. <sighs> You'll see all our parachutes stowed right in front of you. They're just too bulky to wear when we're sat at the seats. Oh. But... If we do have to ditch, I promise I'll give everyone plenty of warning so we can grab one and get in buckled on in time. Oh, and when you clamber through to the front, do watch your head on the mid-upper turret. It's only been recently fitted and there isn't much room for us to crawl forward. Just as well you want a big lad, eh? <laughs> oh, and another thing. I recommend for takeoff and landing you always perch on the floor alongside my pilot seat. Less risky than sitting at your station in the front of the plane. Oh. Just in case we do have a mishap. Stuck down there, you'd quickly find yourself nearest the accident if you get my drift. Thanks, Skip. We'll go. Good, that's a bit quieter with the window closed, but it's going to be too noisy through the whole flight to have much conversation. Ken, how are these engines looking now? Oil pressure coming up nicely on number four, Skip. All looking good this evening. Thanks, Ken. Paul, we've only got a few minutes until the last engine is slowly warmed up, so let's go through the mission briefing once more, but slightly slower. When you're new, the briefings can appear to be taken at a frightful lick, but you'll get the hang of it soon enough, I'm sure. Thanks, Skip. I wouldn't say no to that. Right. We're going to be part of an attack force codenamed Caesar. Around 100 bombers drawn from our squadrons across Lincolnshire and Cambridge. Tonight we're off to Hamburg Docks, where our targets are the U-boat sheds and the dock installations. But we must watch the bomb line so that we don't hit any hospital ships in the harbour. They'll be smothered in huge red crosses, so it'll be really easy to spot. And if the clouds come over so that you have no clear visibility, then the mission is abandoned. Code word for that is Coca-Cola. And if I give you the command soap suds, then it means you cease bombing immediately. Got it? Yes, Skip, got it. Coca-Cola is mission abandoned. Soap suds, I cease bombing straight away. Now, I have to get down to business. Uh, the rest of your questions will just have to wait until we're fully airborne. I need all my concentration for takeoff. And spot the code words we use to confuse any Nazis listening in to our frequencies. Chocks away. Bomb Rage Tower from G. George. Which runway is in use, please? G. George from Fun Range, runway 34, over. Roger, out. Anything behind us on the runway, Roy? All clear, Scott. All set, we've got the green light. Everyone stand by for takeoff. 60, 70, 80, 85, full power. 90, 95, 100. Wheels up. 110, 120, 130, 140. Engine rev 2850, boost plus 9. Roger again, 5 degrees flapping. 
Another five degrees. Flap fully retracted. Okay, 2660, 45. Okie doke. 2100 plus four. She's nice to handle this evening. Course of target, Frank. Zero north, zero degrees. Yes, close base, being yours, AK. Roger. Sounds really exciting, Daddy. Did they name each aeroplane after the pilot? A and what did they mean by angels? <laughs> oh, no. No, it's nothing more than a pure coincidence that our George was piloting G for George. We, the same crew, also flew together in A for Apple, and H for Harry, and a number of others. Ah, but the favourite blank for us all was G George. Though don't go getting any romantic illusions about flying, Popsy. The plane was built for one purpose, and one purpose only to try and shorten the war by bombing the Nazis into submission. Inside it was surprisingly narrow and incredibly cramped. Plus there were many, many gaps in the fuselage, all round each gun turret and the bomb bay doors, plus where equipment needed to stick out like the machine guns and the radio antennas. None of these openings were draft-proofed, and believe me, when you are cruising on a mission it is perishing cold outside, no matter the time of day or night. And it's no better in summer than winter either, at best, the outside temperature at Angel's 12, that's RAF code for 12,000 feet, oh. would be 16 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. Wow, that is cold. How did you survive? Well, we were issued with early prototype flying suits that were not only thick and padded, but actually contained an electric element that warmed up when plugged into the sockets dotted around the plane. They were called Type G flying suits for some reason. Really? Back in those days? <laughs> yes, Poppet. It wasn't quite the Dark Ages. We did have some of the latest inventions which the Boffins built for us. Having said that, I had to unplug mine every time I changed seating position and plug it back in again once I'd moved. But we all wore thick gloves and fur-lined flying boots as well. And even those had heating elements built into them. But it still wasn't something we looked forward to. The absolute perishing cold of night flying in a drafty plane. For nigh on nine hours, some missions particularly as we couldn't exactly get up and do star jumps to try and get warm again. In that photo up there of you all, which one is George? Oh, uh, he's the one sitting in the centre, as you would expect for the skipper. And I can see you standing at the back. <laughs> yes. But why is it only you and George have peaked caps? And um, why aren't either of you wearing them straight? <laughs> oh, well, uh, to be honest, we thought we looked more dashing if our caps were set at a jaunty angle. <laughs> well, it seems a bit silly now. But well, we were all very young then. I was just twenty-two. That's, what, only thirteen years older than you are now, Andy? And at twenty-six, George was the eldest of us all. The reasons we are the ones wearing the caps is that we were what's called commissioned officers. The rest of the men in the picture were other ranks, which is why they wear those odd-looking headgear worn diagonally, called forage caps. So was George the big boss then, being the pilot, I mean. Well, looking back on it now, we were both pretty junior officers at the time. Huh? I was a flying officer, and George was the next rank up, a flight lieutenant. <laughs> Funny thing, in Civvy Street before the war, George had been a bus driver for London Transport. <laughs> we used to joke that navigating a double-decker bus around the capital must have somehow given him all the skills the RAF thought he needed to steer a four-engined heavy bomber through the skies. <laughs> oh, well... It wasn't all excitement and adrenaline by any means. From time to time, things could go wrong. Now oh, there's another fight that you've got a little blow. In the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia, everyone now on the trail of the Lonesome Pine. In the pale moonshine. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That's quite enough. We're just passing over the Lincolnshire coast, so ten minutes to run. Everyone prepare for landing. Well, from that reaction ball, you've clearly now been accepted as one of the boys. <laughs> Having said that, I reckon you still owe us all a pint in the mess after your little snaffle of yours, <laughs> as our Yank cousins would say. Yes, Skip. Definitely. 
I'm sorry about overshooting the target. Ah, well, it happens, Paul. And that's all there is to say about it. There is no way we can return to base with a full bomb load. Going around again was the only choice we had. Even though we did mean having to run the Gordon for the second time over all that fierce anti-aircraft fire. To be perfectly honest, even if we didn't have the camera recording the result of our bomb drops, we could never consider simply dumping our payload into the sea. Each one of those expensive bombs needs to reach its target with winter cow ruddy Hitler into surrendering. Fully understood, Skip. Oh, and I don't think Roy stuck at the back there will be talking to me for a while yet. He was really unhappy about us having to face all that awful barrage of ACAC shells a second time. Ah, don't worry, Julie, about it, Paul. All tail in Charlie's are inherently mourners. Goes with the job of rear gunner. He'll get over it. <laughs> Boost down to plus two. I was going to say, don't let it happen again. Ah, but I don't think you'll ever forget to your dying day how very unpopular you suddenly become this evening when you told us you missed that target. Order course, 265 degrees, Skip. Roger, Frank. Now, you'll have to excuse me. I'm getting close to our final approach, and I need to concentrate fully on getting us all down safely. Look out for the drone any time now, boys. The G-direction finder's playing up again. Thank goodness for small mercies that it's just starting to get light. Dream down, starboard, Skip. That's the one, Frank. Somebody wake up the radio operator. Oi, Skip. Oi, you heard that? Right down, toilet doesn't mean I'm nothing. We'll have you know. And everyone, keep your eyes peeled for where they position the caravan. I need to be sure which runway is in use now. Orangutan! Hello, T. George, this is phone range. You've been warned before. Kindly stick to the set RT procedures and code words, thank you. Uh, over. Prepare to land, everyone. 20 degrees flap, all pumps on, cold air, M gear. 2750 rev. Caravan still marking runway 34. Roger. Wheels down. Wheels locked down. Now, this is where it starts to get a bit bumpy. G. George now downwind. Roger, G. George. Another 10 degrees flat again. Ground shows up clearly now, doesn't it, Paul? I'll just let the tower know we're on final approach. G. George, funnels. Okay, G. George. Good. We're clear to land. 130, 115. 110, 15, 15, 100, 85, cut. That's a really smooth landing, Skip, after, what, six and a half hours of concentrated flying with no break? Oh, thanks, Paul. And if you ever have problems staying awake on these nighttime missions, the doctors have wakey-wakey pills you can let you have if you need. They're called Benza... Ben's a... Ben's a dream? That's it. But be warned, when I took a couple a few months back, I found I needed more pills, different pills from the M.O. to help me get to sleep that night when we got home. By that point, I was just totally wide awake. I'll finish off the shutdown checks now and see you in the debriefing room. If you are enjoying Theatrephonic, we would really appreciate your support. By donating to our Patreon, you can help us produce more frequent episodes as well as more additional content. And by signing up to our Patreon, you will gain instant access to ad-free episodes, blooper reels and Q&A sessions, as well as the opportunity to watch live recordings and name a character in a play. Visit patreon.com forward slash Theatrephonic for more information. That's patreon.com forward slash Theatrephonic to get more of what you love. Bon, bon. That's Brill. What happened to you all when the war was over? Frustratingly, we weren't demobbed as soon as VE Day came around a couple of months later. The RAF still needed us, not least because the Japanese hadn't surrendered by then. We continued to be at war with them for another five months, right up to mid-August 45. Cool. Were you involved in dropping the atomic bomb then? 
Oh, no, no. That was purely a yank show. So what did you all do then, with the war against the Germans being over? Mostly flying back to Italy, all the Italian prisoners of war who had been held in camps around Britain, so they couldn't fight against us anymore. To be perfectly honest with you, most of them told us they were delighted to be able to sit out the war safely in the UK, where they were well looked after. And no danger of being killed in action, you see. But with the war over, it was OK to release them all to go back to their families. Frankly, in those months immediately after the war was over, we were nothing more than a glorified bus service. Just like George had been before the war in, um, Civvy Street. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> I must confess we didn't miss the opportunity to josh him about the whole situation. And by then, there was nothing dangerous for us in those missions, the Nazis having surrendered in May. And by then, of course, Hitler had taken his own life. And did you keep in touch with each other after the war was over? In my Biggles books, he often talks about regimental reunions. Do you know, funnily enough, we didn't. I was invited to George's wedding a year or so later, but I wasn't free to go, unfortunately. And the following year, Frank, uh, the navigator, suggested he and I meet up for a drink, which I did, but we found we had so little to talk about, other than reminisce about our flights together, that the conversation soon petered out, and we agreed to go our separate ways after that. You see... Things had started to go sour for Bomber Command at that point. Sour? What do you mean, Daddy? Well, it all hinged around Winston Churchill, our Prime Minister during the war. I know him. He was the one that died last Christmas, wasn't he? Yes, that's him. Well, a few weeks after Christmas. You see, Churchill had originally been all in favour of the carpet bombing, which Bomber Harris believed would quickly force Hitler into surrender. Give the Nazis a bloody nose. Pay them back for Coventry for Southampton, for Plymouth, and above all, for the terrible suffering of Londoners during the Blitz. <laughs> uh, but he soon got cold feet. It may have been the shock of reading the ever-rising civilian death toll that the Nazis pumped out in their newspapers. Mark you, they would always exaggerate the figures when it suited them. Or it could have been that Churchill was starting to worry about whether he could win the general election that was coming up in July. I guess he, like all politicians before and since, didn't want his name to be associated with damaging headlines. Whatever, he then begins to distance himself from the decision, which he himself had supported in Cabinet, remember, and he starts to pass the blame on to Harris, claiming all the casualties were down to Harris's pig-headed drive to continue with the large bombing raids, even though there was no evidence that the Nazis were about to throw in the towel. Well, that's wrong. And I'll tell you, the icing on the cake was that they organised a giant victory parade in central London the summer of the following year, 46. Representatives from the armed forces of all the Allied nations around the globe were invited to march past in front of the King and Queen and Churchill. So the Majesties and Churchill, plus the general public of course, could show their appreciation for all the dangers and sacrifices we made. But no one from Bomber Command was invited to join in. Not a single one. All the other branches of the RAF had their bigwigs there, but no Arthur Harris. Nor were any of us from Bomber Command asked to march with the rest of the military. Oh, I can tell you it made us feel like real outcasts. Pariahs. Mm. It was a pretty miserable time for all of us. That just doesn't seem fair, Daddy. Particularly after so many of you got killed. Exactly. And just as a case in point, they calculated that more than 8,000 aircrew in Bomber Command died purely from accidents that occurred during training, not even on a mission against the enemy. How come? Well, I don't know for sure, but... It's bound to be a combination of major mechanical failures of every description, uh, mid-air collisions. We did fly in very tight formations, even through cloud where you couldn't see a thing. And you did hear of trainee pilots practicing how to recover from a spin, but were then unable to pull up again and crashed into the ground. And always think of their poor instructors, who in many cases would also be killed alongside their trainee. Imagine what that must have been like for their widow and children. And to cap everything, we were never awarded a specific medal to recognise all that we had done to contribute to victory in Europe for the Allies. Every other branch of the British Armed Forces were given a commemorative medal for their particular theatre of war, which they can wear with a special pride. Gongs like the, uh, the Burma Star, the Pacific Star, the Atlantic Star and so on. Not us, though. To this day, we have only got the standard three 39-45 campaign medals that were handed out to everyone who served on active duty. Nor is there a dedicated memorial to our fallen comrades anywhere. Not in London, not in High Wycombe where we had our HQ, nor anywhere else. It's just like we're a, an embarrassment that's been airbrushed out of history. So, 
How many bombs do you think you must have dropped on the Germans in those last two months of the war? Oh, well, uh, let me see. Well, a Lank could hold 14 bombs, each with a thousand pounds of explosive. So that's 14,000 pounds. I flew roughly 10 missions in all, so that would make, um, well, um, 140,000 pounds of explosive. What's that? A little over gosh, 60 tons, oh, I guess. Gosh, 30, 60 tons mm. of high explosive. That would have killed an awful lot of Germans, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. Uh, I suppose it's likely they would have done. Hmm. Well, perhaps you should ask your earlier question again, Popsy. Which one? Whether I had killed any Germans. The honest answer, of course, is yes. I'm sorry to admit it, but I did. While we're talking about all this, I, I don't mind admitting that to this day... I'm haunted by a raid which took place on March 16th, 1945. That date is etched on my brain. With shame. It was over the German town of Würzburg. Our payload was a mixture of a few conventional bombs, but many incendiary bombs. Have you come across them in those books yet? No. What were they? Now, they were relatively small devices, uh, about 30 pounds in weight each, and we would carry 12 of them. They had a small parachute to slow down their descent, and when they hit the ground, they sent out an extremely hot flame, about 15 foot long, that burned for around two minutes. They claimed the flame was so hot it could crumble a brick wall. Well, it certainly incinerated anything containing wood. The original intention was to burn down the Nazi war factories, but at the same time, avoid reducing all the neighboring houses to rubble. But what the Boffins hadn't understood is that when a mass raid of bombers drop hundreds of incendiary devices all at the same time, they create such a huge fire, the heat gets so intense it actually creates its own wind system. And that means it spreads extremely fast, faster than anyone can run, and it's totally out of control. It can switch direction in an instant, often swirling back in the direction it has just come. Well, just like what happens occasionally in the Australian outback. The incendiary bombs I and all the other bomb aimers dropped that night caused such a huge firestorm it ripped through the town, destroying all buildings in its path and killing between 4,000 and 5,000 people who lived there, civilians every one of them. Do you know, there's not been a day that has gone by since then that I, that I haven't thought about the citizens of Würzburg. At 12,000 feet I had a ringside view of the whole town alight. Nothing like a conventional bombing mission. We actually felt the heat, even up at that height. Every time we go to church, I pray for all the victims of my bomb aiming, and for the families, and indeed for all victims of our raids in G. George, and of all the other planes of Bomber Command. Look, I know that the Nazis did the same to us. Uh, the beautiful historic center of Coventry up the road from here was totally annihilated by the Nazis in 1940. And Mummy and I lost a dear friend who died in the London Blitz that same year. But to the day I die, I will never be proud of what I helped do. So perhaps you can understand now why I haven't talked to you before about my time in the RAF. Oh, oh excuse me. Okay, I see. I love you, Daddy. Hug? Oh, well, yes. Yes, a hug would be good. I, I think you're a hero. You flew mission after scary mission and you survived, despite the high chances you would be killed. Thank you, Andy. A hero, I most certainly am not. I just did my job. Oh, where are you off to? Going up to my room. Daddy, who was Albert Speer? Hmm? Yes, it talks in this book about a Nazi leader called Albert Speer. Oh, oh I think you'll find it's pronounced Albert Speer. Why are you interested in Hitler's favourite architect? What have you been up to for the past hour? Well, I've been going through all your books on the Second World War. <laughs> oh yes, all of them. Well, all the ones that talk about Britain's bombing raids. And then I found this. Here, see for yourself. Hmm. Well, okay. Where? Ah, got it. 
Following his capture in May 1945, Albert Speer, Hitler's Reich Minister of Armaments and War Production, made the revealing observation that because of the Allies' bombing campaign, the Nazis' air force had been forced to defend German cities, Berlin especially. This meant that after 1943, the Luftwaffe was not able to play a role on the fronts where it mattered. For instance, on D-Day in June 1944, there was hardly any German air defence over Normandy. Ha. Well, well, well. I had no idea, Andy. So maybe we did have a part in shortening the war after all. And that's not all, Daddy. You know Field Marshal Rommel? Oh, yes. He's always turning up in my Victor comic. Well, he told the Nazi leaders, if you can't stop the RAF bombing raids, we can't win the war. <laughs> and Air Marshal Goering said much the same, as did Field Marshal Kessel Ring? Oh, yes. And, and Field Marshal von Wundstedt. It goes on here to say, Failing to defeat Bomber Command was Germany's greatest lost battle of the whole war, even worse than the Battle of Stalingrad in Russia. Gosh. Well, that's a lot to take in. Thank you for that, Andy. I don't mind telling you that I'm still feeling quite raw and emotional after talking to you about the whole thing. Especially after all these years of hearing so many historians lining up to say that we didn't make one jot of difference to the war. Well, maybe perhaps we did, after all. And that would mean all those lives lost in the bombing raids perhaps won't have been completely in vain. Whichever side you were on. I'm really proud of what you did to shorten the war, Daddy. <laughs> Thank you, Andy. Ah, now, it's just about time for Grandstand on the telly. Are you going to stay and watch with me? Yeah. It was almost 70 years after the end of World War II when... Following a prolonged fundraising campaign by veterans associations... The British authorities finally agreed in 2012 to build an impressive Portland Stone Memorial in Green Park, central London. It commemorates all the lives lost in RAF Bomber Command. As well as civilians of all the nations who were killed in air raids during the Second World War. It was unveiled by the Queen in June 2012. The following year, 2013, the Bomber Command Bar was finally approved for surviving veterans or their next of kin. To attach to the ribbon of the standard 1939-1945 star which had been issued to all air crews straight after the war. This was, at last, in recognition of the special effort and sacrifice that all air crew and ground crew had made to help win the war. You have been listening to and The Angels Sing, written by Nigel Foster, directed by Emmeline Brayfield. With Gareth Turkington as Paul, Emmeline Brayfield as Andy, John Cooper Evans as George, and Ashley Shires as Other Air Crew and Spillsby Control. Produced by Cat on a Piano Productions. For a full list of the music in this production, please see the show notes. The Theatophonic theme tune was composed by Jackson Pentland. Performed by Jackson Pentland, Molly Fife Taylor and Emmeline Brayfield. For more information about the Theatophonic podcast, go to catonapiano.uk forward slash theatophonic. Tweet or Instagram us at theatophonic or visit our Facebook page. If you enjoy Theatophonic and would like to get more content, please consider becoming a patron by going to patreon.com forward slash theatophonic. Please don't forget to rate and review. Thank you for listening.